Good evening. Um, before we start, some of you may be new to the chapel, so I just want to uh, let you know that um, the, re the door that most of you came in would be an emergency exit as well as the door in here from the uh, reading room should we have to evacuate quickly. <laughs> it has happened before. Um, also, you may want to know as you go through this opening here and then an immediate right is where the, um, the restroom is. So um, with that business taken care of, we'll be ready to start. Um, now let me welcome you once again to St. James Chapel for the second of our 2014 Fireside Chats. Thank you all for braving this, this weather this evening. Really appreciate you being here. St. James Church has a long history with the Roosevelt family. FDR was baptized right here in the chapel in 1882. And later he served many years on the vestry as well as eventually becoming the senior warden. In fact, the vestry usually met only when the president was back in Hyde Park. So presentations on the Roosevelt family are of special interest to us at St. James, as well as all of Hyde Parkers. Tonight's topic addresses FDR's passion for stamp collecting. His interest in the post office came at a very young age, as family members regularly sent him foreign postage stamps while they were engaged in trade uh, agreements across the, across the pond. Uh, he embraced the, the hobby as a means to learn more about geography and world history by documenting various facts relating to each stamp's origin. When stricken with polio, in 1921, the 39-year-old found much comfort and intellectual stimulation from working with his growing stamp collection. So significant was its impact that he repeatedly credited his involvement with the hobby as having saved his life. When elected President of the United States, FDR appointed his campaign manager, James Farley, to the position of Postmaster General. This partnership between the lifetime stamp enthusiast and the savvy businessman would forever change the face of stamp collecting and the post office department. Our speaker tonight is local author, columnist, and history buff, Anthony Muso. I'm sure most of you, as I, have enjoyed his weekly Dateline comment uh, columns in the Poughkeepsie Journal. The columns feature local historic venues, most of them not very well known, but each with significant ties to local history. This research resulted in his latest project, The Hidden Treasures of the Hudson Valley, Volumes 1 and 2. His earlier book, which we're going to discuss tonight, is FDR and the Post Office, a young boy's fascination, and a world leader's passion. Mr. Muso also writes regularly for a number of national magazines. So please help me welcome tonight, Anthony Muso. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, we have a nice audience here tonight. Thanks for coming out in this weather. Um, First of all, I want to thank uh, Sue DiLorenzo and the committee of the Fireside Chats for inviting me back for my second consecutive year. Uh, last year we did Hidden Treasures of the Hudson Valley, Volume 1. Um, and maybe I'll come back in the future to do uh, Hidden Treasures of the Hudson Valley, Volume 2. Um, for those of you that missed Volume 1, actually, I'm going to be giving that talk at Cranberries at 4 o'clock on Sunday. We do a little advertisement, too. It's all Hyde Park related, so it's all good. Uh, Sue called me yesterday and she said, what do you think we should do uh, tomorrow night? I was coming down pretty bad when she called me up and I said, Sue, I have never had this presentation out of all the five different books that I do lectures on. I've never had this one canceled and I credit that to the post office motto of never, neither rain nor snow. <laughs> and, and in fact, uh, I brought my notes in a postal thing. We do advertisement. I had a 38 career with the post office, so I still carry these around because my pension comes in. <laughs> and that's a good thing. 
I was a writer editor of a monthly magazine for the post office and I was a media spokesperson and that's how I really got started learning about I kept seeing his name Franklin Roosevelt whenever I had to go research in the postal archives and it's not unusual to see presidents names I've seen Kennedy and Nixon and Reagan and everybody else but Franklin Roosevelt's name came up more and more so one season um, as a manager at my level, you either use your vacation time or you lose it at the end of the year, and I don't like giving anything back to the government for free. So I took the week before Christmas and New Year's off. I applied for a researcher's pass at the Presidential Library just to satisfy my own curiosity on Roosevelt and the post office. And I remember the first day I went up there, uh, I said to the lady, could you bring me any material you have on Franklin Roosevelt's association with the post office? And when the third huge cart rolled behind me, I knew this was gonna be more than my curiosity. I spent 40 hours there that week, started taking vacation time, and then of course, because I was in that field in the post office, I started using the archives down in Manhattan and I was frequently in Washington, D.C., and I would use their archives, and three years later, a book came out of my curiosity. So that was a good thing. You know, when, when, um, when people think of Franklin Roosevelt, they think of different things. They might think of the president that restored the economy after the Great Depression. Um, other people think of the wartime president, the one that met with Stalin and, and Churchill, those high-profile meetings. And other people also think of Roosevelt as the only person in the history of our country to serve more than two terms as President of the United States. He was elected four different times, and that never happened again after that. Um, and those are great accomplishments, and, but what really got overshadowed was the enormous impact that Franklin Roosevelt had on both the post office department when he was president and on stamp collecting in general. When Roosevelt was around, stamp collecting was thought to be a very trivial hobby. It was great for kids, but when you got to be an adult, it wasn't worthy of your time. That was the thinking at that time. Well, Roosevelt changed all of that, not by lecturing about it, but just by his open enthusiasm about his own stamp collection. And I'm going to give you some examples of that later. He also elevated the post office's focus as to the benefits of stamp collectors coming into the post office. I'll give you a fast example. If I'm online as a stamp collector and you're in front of me, you go to the window and buy a 49 cent stamp and you put it on an envelope and drop it in the, in the chute and the post office has to take it and sort it, send it to Stewart Airport, maybe fly it across the country to California and then another clerk takes it and resorts it and a carrier delivers it. That's a lot of labor for 49 cents. And uh, now I come to the window and I buy the same 49 cent stamp and I'm a collector and I go home, put it in an album and shut the drawer. It's 100% profit. The post office makes 100% because they don't have to do anything. They just sold the stamp. And FDR was the one that convinced the post office of looking at it that way. When he became president of the United States, he took a job away from an assistant postmaster general. He insisted on reviewing and approving every stamp that came out during his four terms of office, and there were 200, more than 200 stamps. And he was not a rubber stamp president. I have several examples in the book where he stopped the stamp presses at the 11th hour because he found out that something wasn't historically accurate in the artwork and he would stop the presses and let the artist do it again. He was a stickler for historic accuracy. Uh, he also designed several stamps, and we're gonna see one of his uh, rough sketches tonight. Uh, and the last thing he did was his WPA project. They built federal buildings all around the country to bring people back into the workforce to recover from the Great Depression. Well, 406 of those buildings were post offices. And people might think it's a coincidence. I don't think it was a coincidence. Franklin Roosevelt loved the post office and he wanted to do what he had to do. Now to, um, to see how Roosevelt got involved in stamp collecting, you have to go back to his mother, Sarah. Sarah Delano grew up in Algona, uh, an estate down in the Bombville district of Newburgh. And she was very close with her father, Warren. 
And when she was very young, five or six, Warren had to go to the Far East. He was a businessman. He had to go on an extended trip, and she was very distressed. And so what Warren Delano thought he would do is he would come up with something to have a connection with his daughter. And he started sending her stamps on a regular basis. And she was satisfied with that. It was kind of a connection to her dad, and she started a little stamp collection. As she grew older, she continued to add to the collection. But remember what I just told you about not being worthy of an adult's time. So when she turned 18, she turned the whole collection over to her younger brother, Frederick. And she went on with adult activities. Uh, Sarah married James Roosevelt, who was much, much older than her. Uh, in fact, they had one child, Franklin, and when Franklin was born, James was old enough to have been his grandfather rather than his father, but that didn't dissuade him from teaching Franklin Roosevelt how to horseback ride on the estate, how to sail on the Hudson River, and when he was eight years old, his mother and father introduced him to the collection of st uh, stamp collecting, the hobby of stamp collecting. I was pretty amazed that at eight years old, but I'm looking at all these documents at the Presidential Library, at eight years old, Franklin Roosevelt had an intense history in geography and history. He had an intense interest in those uh, functions. Are there any stamp collectors in the house? Okay, stamp collectors normally have an album and you line the stamps up in the album. Franklin Roosevelt put one stamp on, on a page. He was more interested in why the person, place, or event pictured on the stamp was honored with a postage stamp, because it is an honor. I can tell you in my lifetime, you'll never see this face on a postage stamp. <laughs> it's something special. You have to do something special. And he was very inquisitive. He wanted to know. And so what he did was he would study the person, place, or event on the stamp, put the one stamp in the album, and fill the page with notes. So it was kind of like a learning experience for him. And that's what he, he did for the rest of his life. He got so good at this that his uncle Frederick, when Franklin was 12 years old, gave him his whole stamp collection, which of course was Sarah's too. So at 12, Franklin had a massive stamp collection. Now in the research, I couldn't find anything from his years in high school, but certainly from the time he went to college, until one hour before he died in Warm Spring, Georgia in uh, 1945, he worked on his stamp collection for one hour a day, usually at nighttime before he went to bed, especially as president, he said it was a great way to unwind from the day, and he felt it was very mentally stimulating to do that. But he had a portion of his stamp collection wherever he went. When he was governor of New York, he had it up in Albany. When he was uh, in the White House, he certainly had it in the White House, but he also had a portion of his collection in Warm Springs, Georgia. He brought a portion of his stamp collection to the famous war conferences with Churchill and, and Stalin, and he would work on it for about an hour at night. And that's all documented. And he just felt it was a great way to learn, and it was a great way to unwind from the stresses of the day. Now, when he was appointed Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I, he was sent to Santo Domingo and to Haiti. And FDR being FDR, he embraced their stamps right away and started buying up the whole collection of any stamps he can get from those countries. In 1921, the family was up at Camp Abello in New Brunswick, Canada, vacationing, and FDR fell very ill. He was misdiagnosed as having a bad flu and then the proper diagnosis was infantile paralysis, and he was confined to a wheelchair. Now, a young man who already started his political career here in Dutchess County, he was holding local positions, he had a great education, he was a man of means. This could have been very devastating for him. It could have really got him to the point of pity and just shutting down. And uh, that's what Sue was talking about. He credited in four different occasions I saw in his handwriting, he credited stamp collecting with saving his life during that period because it gave him the motivation to get out of bed, get in his wheelchair, he would wheel over to a table in Springwood at his estate and pour over his collection for 10 hours a day. And he just enjoyed the mental stimulation of the whole process. Well, obviously something went right because in 1928, he uh, decided to run for governor. He won the election and he brought up, I had a little humorous story of when he was governor. 
Uh, but I credit when he became governor of New York as the time that stamp collecting in people's minds started turning the page to being accepted by adults because now you had a man that was you know very powerful the governor of New York is a big position in this country and they knew he was a man of means a very intelligent man and he was openly talking about his stamp collection all the time and suddenly it was acceptable for two people to be at a cocktail party in Manhattan talking about their latest stamp acquisition you know, if Governor Roosevelt can do it, we certainly can do it. Um, the, the humorous story that I had of him as governor was uh, I read a couple of notes where on a particularly boring telephone conversation while he was governor, he would hold the phone with his left hand, open his right drawer of his desk, and take out his stamps and start working on them to get through the boring conversation. While he was governor, he accepted honorary memberships in the Masonic Stamp Club, the Washington Philatelic Society, the Fort Orange Stamp Club of Albany, and the Empire State Philatelic Association. In 1931, he became a lifetime member of the most prestigious stamp collecting organization in the world, the American Philatelic Society. Now, the early 30s, he had decided he wanted to make a run for president. And what he did was he got another young politician, very savvy man, very, very uh, wise man, James Aloysius Folly, lived in Grassy Point down in Rockland County, and he took him on as his campaign manager for president. And when, uh, when Folly came on board, he knew that Roosevelt was building this connection with everyday people like you and me through his stamp collection. So what he did was, he designed these envelopes. And the envelope says, a stamp collector for president, the stamp of approval, Franklin D. Roosevelt, member of the American Philatelic Society. They would put a regular stamp up in, up in the corner there, and every single piece of campaign literature went out in these envelopes all over the country. He just wanted to make the people know that Franklin Roosevelt's just like you. He's a stamp collector. You're, you know, he's no different than you because he's wealthy and he's a you know politician or whatever. Well, the uh, the process worked, and he beat Herbert Hoover by a pretty decent margin. And when he was sworn in, which was on March 4th, in those days they swore the president in March 4th rather than January 20th, like today. One of the organizations that he joined while he was in Albany, the Empire State Philatelic Association, put out this commemorative envelope. They put what's called in the collecting industry on the left-hand side, it's called a cachet. It's just artwork related to what you're commemorating. And it says Empire State Philatelic Association. They have a um, March 4th, 1933, with a caricature of Roosevelt, a facsimile autograph underneath, and it was postmarked in Washington on March 4th. Um, they basically put this envelope out because they were very proud to have one of their members in the Oval Office. What really happened with this was it turned into another whole segment of stamp collecting because you can get inauguration day covers, they call them today, from Roosevelt's time right down to Obama and everyone in between, when the president is sworn in, there are various commercial companies now that put these out as inauguration day covers. And there's a whole different segment of stamp collectors that just collect these. You know how like some stamp collectors collect one stamp, others will collect a block of four, some will collect sheets. This is another segment of the hobby and it just started by people that wanted to honor Roosevelt for being their member. Very interesting. Now his first day in the Oval Office, I would have loved to have been there because he found out that his predecessor, Herbert Hoover, had put a policy in place that I can only imagine FDR had a smile on from ear to ear. Hoover was also a stamp collector, but not nearly on the level as Roosevelt. And so what Hoover did was he made a deal with the Department of State, the Secretary of State, that all envelopes like this that were received by the Secretary of State. Once the contents were taken out, the envelopes that would be sent to the Oval Office so the President could see if he needed the stamps for his collection. Now it gets better than that. 
because I read a letter in Franklin Roosevelt's handwriting from the President of the United States on White House stationery to the Secretary of State, and I was, I said, wow, this must have fell in this, in this box by accident, but I gotta read, this is great, a President to a Secretary of State, handwritten. And in the letter, it was indeed postal related because Franklin Roosevelt was yelling at the Secretary of State in writing, saying that he was accusing some of the Department of State people not sending him all the envelopes. <laughs> and he wanted all the envelopes. Now, what would happen with these stamps if Frank, and by the way, this cover here, and many of the illustrated pieces you're gonna see today, if not all, are on display, the originals are on display on the tables here, and I welcome you to come and take a look at them. If you have any questions, I'll be at the table to answer them. But I bought this in a secondary auction, uh, and on the back it is stamped from the personal collection of Franklin D. Roosevelt. I bought many items because the book is very well illustrated, and I wanted to do that, so I bought a lot of items. But what would happen if Roosevelt didn't need these stamps? Poor Missy LeHand, his secretary, Roosevelt was receiving thousands of letters from children all over the country. Dear Mr. President, we're starting a stamp collection. And he had Missy LeHand snip off all the stamps that he wasn't going to use, put 25 in a package, and mail them with a letter to the children, with a letter from Franklin Roosevelt wishing them well in their collection. So Missy LeHand spent many hours clipping stamps. He became so well known for his stamp collection that he started receiving gifts from all around the world. The Pope sent him a set of uh, Vatican stamps. The King of Egypt and King Peter II of Yugoslavia sent Roosevelt complete sets of all their country's stamps. He got stamps from the Dalai Lama. And on one occasion, a cover flown across the Atlantic by Amelia Earhart was presented to Roosevelt from her husband. Now you might say, well, you know, and he kept every one of them, and you might say, well, you know, he, of course he kept every one of them, those are all famous people. But folks like you and I were sending him things all the time, and, and trust me, he did not throw anything out. He embraced everything, and he appreciated everything. I want to show you a couple of examples. This is a cover, if you look at the postmark, it came out on April 30th, 1933. So Roosevelt was only in office one month. And this isn't the President's Day that we know today, in February, you know, for, for Lincoln and Washington. This is President's Day that existed in April of 33 and never existed again. It was uh, organized by the Hearst newspapers and the Pittsburgh Telegraph. They put out a commemorative envelope calling it President's Day with Roosevelt's picture. I believe personally that they did this just to honor the president, just to honor Roosevelt, because they never had this day anymore after that. But this is the way people's minds were changing towards stamp collecting. Now people like you and I, Roosevelt's birthday, which they just celebrated at the uh, at the Presidential Library, uh, I guess a week ago, uh, is on January 30th. Instead of sending Roosevelt a birthday card for his birthday, people from around the country would send him a commemorative envelope with his picture on the side, the nation's wish to our president, happy birthday. They would mail it to a postmaster and get it postmarked on, Washington, uh, on January 30th. This one is postmarked in Washington, D.C. 1934, so this was his second year in office, and they would mail him this as a birthday greeting and also a part for his collection. Again, he saved every one of them. To commemorate a presidential cruise, they put out a cover in 1935, postmarked on the USS Houston, and this one, as you can see, was autographed in later years by Eleanor Roosevelt. And this was part of my collection. My personal collection is I collect autograph first day covers, so I had already had this in my collection. Um, anyone collect any items, coins, dolls, uh, any kind of things, you'll know that uh, the most important thing about collecting is you want to have the Holy Grail. You want to have something that no other collector in your field has. Well, one collector got very ingenious, and he wanted to send something to Roosevelt that possibly no one else thought of. And he did a lot of research, which I think FDR really appreciated, and he found three towns or cities in one state. 
he sent the envelopes to those three postmasters, asked for the uh, January 30th postmark, and when he got them all back, he sent a set of three envelopes to Franklin Roosevelt as a birthday greeting, and they were postmarked in Franklin, Minnesota, Delano, Minnesota, and Roosevelt, Minnesota. I can guarantee you Roosevelt loved this. Even during the war, I mean, this was unheard of. Think about this now that 20 years before it was unacceptable for adults to waste their time with stamp collecting. Even during the war, they were putting envelopes out. These are called patriotic covers, and here's one with a caricature of FDR talking to Churchill. The caption reads, did I ever show you my stamps, Winnie? And the three stamps you're looking at up there are three pictures of a big boot stamping out Hirohito, Mussolini, and Hitler. Postmarked in 1943. Another one is called the Allied Victory, Stam uh, Victory Cover, and this was a very common cover during World War II. They would put it out for the Allied forces. Uh, and then I, I also put in one that I was involved in during my own career. Uh, this one came out while I was working in the post office. And it was a set that was put out on the 50th anniversary of World War II. And I put it in this presentation just to show you he's still very much part of stamps and, and stamp collecting, and he's prominently featured on these. I said that uh, James Aloysius Foley was his campaign manager when he ran for president, and this is Mr. Foley standing here with the, um, the black hat on. And obviously, if you're a campaign manager of a successful candidate, there's a good chance you're going to get a nice position in the administration. The, I believe that James Farley got the uh, plum of the Roosevelt administration. He was appointed postmaster general, which at that time was a cabinet position. Uh, let me just give you an idea of the accomplishments that Franklin Roosevelt, the president slash stamp collector, and James Farley, the savvy businessman slash postmaster general, accomplished when they were in office. First of all, do you remember about 15 or 20 years ago when baseball card shops started opening everywhere? They were, they were selling the old Mickey Mantle cards, and people like me were running home and getting horrified when I found out my mother threw my cards out. <laughs> yeah. I told her she threw a mortgage out on me. Well, during Roosevelt's time, stamp shops were opening everywhere. Almost every town uh, had a stamp shop. Farley never liked the idea that the first time people saw new stamps was when they went to the post office and they asked for a sheet of stamps and something new came across the counter. He said, we have to publicize stamps more. So he created what's called a first day ceremony. And what it is, is say there was a stamp of Roosevelt that came out. He might have some of Roosevelt's children talking at the ceremony. There would be a big veil over an enlargement of the stamp, and it always ended with the unveiling of the stamp. And it was a big ceremony, and the whole idea was to get the media out there to report it, and people would know that there were new stamps out. He wanted to keep that in people's minds. One item that Franklin Roosevelt suggested to Farley he never liked the idea that you would walk into a post office as a stamp collector and you were trying to go through the stamps to see what was available and someone was grumbling behind you for taking too long because they were holding a big package. So they created what they called the philatelic window and that was only for stamp collectors. And you could take all the time in the world because the only person that would be behind you was another collector. If you go into the Poughkeepsie post office today, you walk straight ahead towards the counter and look all the way to your left, it's still marked philatelic window. It's still in there. I believe they use it for passports now because through the years with budget cuts and stamp collecting kind of dwindled, they use them for different purposes. But it is still marked philatelic window in the Poughkeepsie Post Office. Newspapers like the Poughkeepsie Eagle started running weekly stamp columns. Radio stations started having guests on to talk about the newest stamps and stamp conventions. So it was really becoming a, a very important uh, part of social culture. To give you an idea of the impact that these two men had on the industry, 
When Franklin Roosevelt took office in 1933, there were an estimated 2 million stamp collectors in the United States. By 1938, that grew to 9 million. Now remember the illustration I gave you about a stamp collector going to the post office and putting the stamp in the drawer and closing it, 100% profit for the post office. Well, philatelic sales, or sales from, to stamp collectors, went from $300,000 in 1933 to $2 million a year by 1940. It was called the golden age of stamp collecting. Franklin Roosevelt started routinely going to every stamp convention around the country. He wanted to be a visible face. And you can see his signature along the side here. He always signed in green ink, James Farley. He would go around and these men just created this hobby, uh, an old hobby that really wasn't well accepted and made it a real powerhouse. If you went into five and tens, like my grandmother used to take me into five and tens years ago, you might have seen a package like this, where you could buy 500 used stamps for 25 cents. Look who's in the center of that stamp thing. Yeah, there's Washington and there's Teddy Roosevelt and Lincoln, and, but look who's in the center. It's Franklin Roosevelt all the way, and that's the effect that he had on this. And I also said that Franklin Roosevelt took away a job from an assistant postmaster general. He wanted to see every stamp and he wanted to make his corrections and his observations on the stamp and he, they could not print it until the president gave him final approval. I don't know how this man did any of his presidential work, but he was having a ball. The first, uh, he, he did 206 stamps while he was president for four terms. Uh, and like I said, he, he sent some of them back and he said they were historically inaccurate and you're going to see an example of that now. But then he started doodling on paper and sending his sketches to the post office department. And this was the first stamp that came out that Franklin Roosevelt designed. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, that's Whistler's mother. Or Franklin Roosevelt designed the verbiage, designed where Whistler's mother would be laid out and everything. And that was the very first one. It came out on Mother's Day in 1934. And guess who got the first cover, the first sheet of stamps? Sarah. Um, here's an illustration now that Franklin Roosevelt, and bear in mind, Franklin Roosevelt was a lot of things, but he wasn't an artist. Here's an original Franklin Roosevelt sketch. And he routinely signed or initialed the sketch and put the date next to it. And this one was for his good friend, Admiral Richard Byrd's second Antarctic expedition. And you can see the lines on the top, you know, 1927, and he's got the lines on the bottom, 1930. He's got all the lines, and this is, well, I want to show you what the postal artist did with this very rudimentary design. A little different, a <laughs> little different. But ironically, ironically, this is one of the stamps that Franklin Roosevelt stopped from going to print and he made the artist redo it because you see this line up at the top here that says 1926 or 1925? Well, that line was about a half an inch further down and he wanted no part of it. And they said, oh, no one's even going to know. And he said, I know. And he made the artist move that line up and redo it. It was literally ready to go on the presses. And that's how much of a stickler he was, uh, you know, for, for historic accuracy. Well, before I get into this, let me, let me continue with the stamp parts of it. You may think that because Franklin Roosevelt was president of the United States and his good buddy Jim Farley was the postmaster general, that Roosevelt got whatever he wanted, but that wasn't the case. At one point, Roosevelt suggested that they do a sheet of 10 different monuments around Washington, D.C., the Jefferson Memorial, the Washington Monument, and do a sheet of stamps on them. Well, the post office rejected it because they just did 10 national parks, Yosemite, Arcadia, and they thought it would be redundant. A more interesting story that I found was, in 1940, the post office put out a set of stamps called Famous American Series, and that honored uh, composers, poets, authors, and inventors. And when Roosevelt was reviewing the stamps, as he did with every one, he saw that in the inventors series, 
there was one honoring Cyrus McCormick, who of course invented the mechanical reaper. Well, Franklin Roosevelt was a lot of things, but he was first and foremost a politician with a long memory. And he called up Jim Farley right away and said, I need to see you in the Oval Office right away. And when Farley got down to the Oval Office, Franklin Roosevelt told him there is no way Cyrus McCormick is going to be in this stamp series. And Farley was very confused. And he said, what are you talking about? He's a great inventor. The mechanical reaper was a very, you know. And he said, listen, his descendant, Robert, was the owner of the Chicago Tribune, and they wrote a lot of articles against the New Deal. And there's no way his ancestor is going to be on a stamp while I'm president. Well, Jim Farley was no shrinking violet either, and the men, by all accounts, were right in each other's faces, arguing back and forth, and they did what all politicians do eventually. They compromised. If you got that 1940 set, you will see that Cyrus McCormick is indeed in the set, but not before Jim Farley agreed to take him off the widely used two-cent stamp and put him on the rarely used three-cent stamp. <laughs> Roosevelt wanted to minimize his face going around the country while he was president. Now, one of the most aggressive projects that Franklin Roosevelt had was the work project, progress projects administration. My Brooklyn is getting confused with my normal talking. Uh, the idea was he felt that government should provide temporary work for people until they got back on their feet. And the way it worked is if Hyde Park wanted a federal building, the local funds would pay for the material and the equipment, the federal government would pay the salaries of the workers, and that's the way it worked. In 1933, FDR approved allotments in the amount of $43 million to construct federal buildings, among them 406 post offices. Now understand that a lot of the 406 were like the Poughkeepsie post office, not like the Hyde Park, but like the Poughkeepsie post office has a second floor. And on the second floor, even though it was the Poughkeepsie post office, you had the Department of Agriculture up there, you had congressmen's offices up there, so they were multiple purpose, a lot of the larger ones, especially the one I worked in down in Manhattan. Um, now, we were blessed in Dutchess County because Franklin Roosevelt was our neighbor. No other county in the entire country had five WPA post offices, Dutchess did. And they go from the south, the first one was Beacon, the old Wappingers Falls, which is the only one that's not a post office anymore, the Poughkeepsie Post Office, the Hyde Park Post Office, and the Rhinebeck Post Office, those were all WPA post offices. And I call them the five jewels of Dutchess County. And I want to uh, go through, uh, just give you some brief stories of, about each of them. The first one to go up uh, happened in Beacon. And this is a one-story Dutch colonial design. What's unique about this building as compared to the other four in Dutchess County is that Roosevelt got an idea after this building went up. He wanted to bring pride back into the communities after the Great Depression. And so after this building went up, the other four buildings had to be modeled on a historic structure in that community so that when you saw it, you had a sense of pride. So this was the only one that wasn't designed after a famous building in the town. But what's unique about this building is you can see the exterior stone on this building. They took that stone from the old West Point foundry, which was just south in Cold Spring, just south of Beacon. Uh, there were the ruins of the West Point foundry there, and they reused these stones, which were estimated to be 180 years old at the time that they used this. Uh, this building was built in the spring of 1936. It opened in summer of 1937, and it cost $68,000 to build. Now, the next building was definitely the grand palace of his five post offices, and that was the Poughkeepsie Post Office. And you may say, well, why, why did he focus on, on Poughkeepsie? Well, it was the county seat. And what he did with this building was pretty incredible. First of all, I'll tell you that this is a larger version of the Dutchess County Courthouse, which sat two blocks south, that, the courthouse that was previous to the one that's standing there now. 
And the historical significance of that building is that's where the ratification of the Constitution for New York State took place. And Roosevelt was a history buff. So this is an enlarged version of that building. Now this is a 32,900 square foot building constructed 1937 and 38 at a cost of $330,000. Pretty incredible. The 48 inch tall 3,500 pound bell up in the top cost $4,400 and they used to put poetry on the insides of bells in those days. Roosevelt said, no, I'm going to write the inscription for this one. And what it says inside, yeah, go figure. He had a lot of time. <laughs> I don't think the man slept. <laughs> what it says inside the bell is ring and perpetuation of American freedom. Now, because of my connections with the post office, I was able to get up in the coupler and get under it and look at it with a flashlight, and it's still in there. It's very faded, but it is in there. FDR personally laid the cornerstone of this building in October 1937. I have a picture of him at the ceremony in this other room, uh, his mother Sarah sitting right behind him. It opened for business on December 5th, 1938. The postmaster at that time was the grandfather of a close friend of mine who lives in Pleasant Valley. The postmaster's name was Charles Lavery. I don't know if you know that name, but Charles Lavery was a very wise man. As soon as he opened the door to his new post office, he ran to the window himself, got an envelope postmarked with the first postmark and mailed it to FDR as a present. <laughs> it's called job security. The next post office that Franklin Roosevelt wanted to put up was in Rhinebeck, New York, and this is an authentic reproduction of a local house built in 1700 by Hendrick Kipp. Now if you go down uh, West Market uh, in Rhinebeck, next to the Beekman Arms, you'll see a blue marker just before you get into Rhinecliff that marks where this house used to be. It burned down. It was in ruins. But Roosevelt wanted it to represent that house to the exact proportion and everything because that is where the first sermon ever took place uh, in Rhinebeck. And that was also the place where a lot of meetings went on for the early colonies. And he felt it was definitely worthy of that. Uh, May 1938, here comes Roosevelt again. He made them clear a lot of trees because he obviously couldn't get out of his car and walk to it. He wanted them to drive him up to the ruins of the Kipp House so that he could look at the layout and the foundation to help the architect build the building. And they did that. Uh, I can tell you this is so exact that on the far side of the building, you can't see it in this picture, there is a 10 inch round bullseye window that serves no purpose. You have to get in it through a half closet in the attic area, which of course I crawled through and got filthy just to check it out. And it is exactly like it was in the Kip house. Like I said, it's just a storage area. It serves no purpose, but that's how detailed. He wanted an exact reproduction. This building was dedicated in 1939 by FDR and the Crown Prince and Princess of Denmark who were visiting Hyde Park with him at the time. Now for the next post office, he went down to Wappingers Falls, and this is the old, this is known today as the old Wappingers Falls post office, and the only one that is no longer serving as a personal post office. This was the first post office ever to be built in Wappingers Falls. Before that time, the post office was either in the postmaster's living room, or it was in a general store, and you moved the can of peas and the bread out of the way, and you bought your stamps. And don't laugh, we still have offices like that. I still said we. I have a fellow postal worker here and I still have a tendency to say, we still have post offices. I'm not in the company anymore. Up in Sullivan County though, there are, there are places in general stores where you have to move the goods out of the way to buy your stamps. This is modeled after a building that is directly across the street from it, the Mazir Brewer House, which is now owned by the Historical Society of Wappingers Falls. And uh, Roosevelt originally wanted this building across the street from where it is in a lot that was owned, uh, is still owned by the church that is right there. And the pastor basically told him in a nice way, I'm sure, no, you can't put it on our property. And that's how it ended up on this corner. 
1988, this building had to close because if you remember the 80s, the influx of people coming into the area and the housing developments, they just couldn't shoehorn another letter carrier into this building and they built another one two blocks east. This is now Village Hall. It was sold to the village of Wappingers Falls and it's Village Hall. Uh, this was uh, dedicated in 1939. It's a 5,100 square foot building and it was built for $50,000. Pretty good cost, huh, John? Construction cost? I'll take that as a house. The last uh, post office that he put up, because as we know, Roosevelt was not only a politician and a stamp collector, he was a very wise man, and he said, if I don't put one in my hometown, they're going to run me out of town. So he put one in High Park, and most of you probably parked in that parking lot tonight, right across the street. FDR wanted to model it after the old 1760 Stottenberg homestead. Believe it or not, they couldn't find any images of it. So this is, they located a pen and ink sketch of John Bard's house, which was located at that time between St. James and the Vanderbilt Barns which was called the Vanderbilt Farm uh, property. Uh, and what they did was, this was what John Bard's house looked like. They replicated it completely, and you could see they're still using that now familiar field stone. You could definitely tell one of his WPA buildings because it has that. And by the way, that field stone he mandated had to come from the local area. He didn't want you going to Pennsylvania or West Virginia to get it. You had to get in the area. The furthest they went away was Cold Spring, and that was still in the area. So, Now, because Franklin Roosevelt didn't want to just uh, create work for construction workers and electricians and plumbers, they had what they called the mural competition. He came up with the idea to further bolster pride in the community. He wanted murals inside each post office that reflected the history of whatever community the post office was in. The Poughkeepsie post office, they have five murals. He contracted three muralists to do it at a cost of $12,200. On the ground floor on the west wall is a representation of what Poughkeepsie looked like in 1839, looking over from Highland. On the east wall over the postmaster's office is a 1939 representation, which would have been contemporary because that's when the building was put up. And then upstairs, Gerald Foster did three murals from different periods, 1600, 1700, and the big, has anyone been in the Poughkeepsie post office on the second floor? It's well worth your while to go up on that second floor and look at the ratification of the Constitution. It is a museum quality piece, and for that $12,000 that they spent, you couldn't buy that piece today. It's a beautiful representation. Um, of course, uh, I did find numerous stories with Roosevelt because he was involved in every process of all five buildings and all the murals. And I wrote, I, I picked up a letter one day that he wrote to uh, an artist that did the 1839 view of Poughkeepsie. That's on the western wall if you ever go in the post office. It's right over the philatelic window. It's a long mural. And uh, I remember the letter verbatim, and I'll give it to you right now. It said, my dear Miss Clitgard, when I was a young boy, my father taught me to sail on the Hudson River. And at no time, in all the time I've been on the Hudson River, I have I ever seen four sails on four different boats blowing in four different directions. <laughs> the woman obviously took artistic license, and Roosevelt wanted no part of it. This is a section of that painting. It's a very long, long mural, but he made her correct all the sails. Because he said, you can't have flags bowling one way and a sail blowing. And she said, but Mr. President, it looks, and he said, no, 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 go do it over. And when Roosevelt tells you to go do it over, you're going to do it over. Uh, another post office I want to show you briefly is Rhinebeck. Rhinebeck, you can see on the top uh, the panels that they put up. It's a 12-panel piece that goes around the post office. It was done by a Rhinebeck artist named Olin Dowes, who was Tracy Dowes' son. Very, very great artist. Um, and it told the history of Rhinebeck. As you go in the front door of Rhinebeck, the history starts right over your left shoulder, and as you walk around, uh, in the book there is one whole chapter 
that guide you through every mural. And I had one or two postmaster friends of mine tell me, what's going on with your book? Because people were in there reading my book and, and looking at the murals. And I said, hey, listen, I'm giving you money. You know, don't worry about it. They're in, they'll buy stamps. <laughs> but you go around and it's very interesting. Um, the one that people miss all the time is when you first walk in the door, it's right over your head. And that one is of FDR dedicating the building with the Prince and Princess of Denmark. That one's right overhead and that ends the series because that's when the building opened. Um, I, I tried as much as I could. This is a beautiful lobby with the, with the uh, wood paneling and everything and I tried as much as I could to get these tacky posters taken down and I was overruled. Can't win all the battles, you have to pick them. Now the Hyde Park Post Office, Roosevelt was so pleased with this that he brought Olin Dowers down to Hyde Park and he had a little more room to work with and this one across the street is a 17 panel. My particular favorite, not because of the book, is the one that's right over on your right as soon as you walk in the front door and that is Roosevelt sitting with, he's with the, uh, that's the school board there uh, he's looking at plans for Roosevelt School in Benjamin Haviland's backyard. Doesn't Benjamin Haviland look thrilled? <laughs> but anyway, he's looking at, that's the Secret Service, is the fellow right in the back of the car by the tree, and he's studying the plans in, in the backyard, and I just really like that, uh, that rendition. Now, we're going to fast forward to April 12th, 1945. Franklin Roosevelt is in Warm Springs, Georgia. He slept late that day. They were going to have a barbecue at his retreat. He was reviewing uh, routine paperwork from the State Department, signing papers while an artist named Elizabeth Shomatoff was painting a portrait of him. And he was talking with his cousins. Daisy was down there and, uh, you know, he had some friends down there and he was talking. His last official act as president was a telephone conversation with the Postmaster General, which by the way, was Frank Walker. I have a whole chapter on this in the book, but after the second term of office, Jim Farley told Roosevelt he was very opposed to anyone going for a third term. It had never been done before. And Roosevelt said, well, I'm gonna do it, and Jim Farley quit. And sadly, as much as they accomplished, the two men never talk again, talk again for their entire life. Uh, in fact, the next Democratic convention, Eleanor Roosevelt went to Jim Farley to try to patch things up, but he, he would have no part of it because he did not think it was right for Roosevelt to run for that third term. He was a political purist. Um, but anyway, uh, he had this conversation with his postmaster general, Frank Walker. He approved the United Nations stamp. And he assured Mr. Walker that he was going to be at the ceremony in San Francisco in two weeks on April 25th, 1945. Half hour later, he reached up and touched his temple, slumped in the chair, and he died from a cerebral hemorrhage at 3.35 p.m. Now, collectors being collectors, someone ran right out and got what they call a death cover. Yes, there is a segment of the hobby that collects death covers. I've seen him for Elvis Presley. As soon as Elvis Presley's death was, was announced, stamp collectors ran out and got covers. This was the day Elvis died. But what this collector probably didn't understand when he was doing it, and I'm sure this artwork on the left-hand side wasn't on the envelope. It was probably a plain white envelope, because how would he know? And then they added that later. But when you think about it, this was not only a death cover for Franklin Roosevelt, it was an inauguration day cover for Harry Truman, because that same day he was sworn in. But something even the collector couldn't have possibly known at that time is he lived in a town in Alabama called Kennedy. And the postmarks are Kennedy, Alabama, and who would have known that 15 years later we'd have another Democratic president named John F. Kennedy. Now, this is the stamp that Franklin Roosevelt approved. This was his last act as President of the United States. And when Postmaster Walker found out that the president died, he stopped the presses and they added Franklin Roosevelt's name underneath the date. No association to the stamp at all, but this became the first stamp, either in image or name, that honored Franklin D. Roosevelt. In the 1970s, a group of stamp collectors right here in Hyde Park founded the FDR Philatelic Society. 
and their goal was to do, collect stamps that had anything to do with Eleanor or Franklin Roosevelt. And they put out this cover on the anniversary of Franklin Roosevelt's death in 1977, and I think they did an outstanding job. What they did was, they postmarked it April 12, 1977, down in Warm Springs, Georgia. They franked it with this last stamp that Franklin Roosevelt ever approved, which was the United Nations, and they put two other Franklin Roosevelt commemoratives on it. The cachet or artwork on the left-hand side is the portrait that Elizabeth Shomatov was painting of Roosevelt. When he passed away, she put the brush down and she never added to it. Today it's known as the unfinished portrait. And then they had Elizabeth Shomatov personally autograph the cover. This is a jewel in my own collection and I was happy to put it in this thing. But as you can imagine, tributes and postal tributes especially started coming from everywhere. Now here's a cover, and the next three covers I show you, I'm going to point out something special. Here's a cover honoring Roosevelt from Cuba. But I want you to take note of the cachet or artwork. He was the President of the United States, and yet they have him in the artwork looking through a magnifying glass as his stamp collection. That's how well known he was for his collection. The next one is from the Philippines. Not only the artwork, but the stamp itself has Franklin Roosevelt studying his stamp collections in the stamp. And then this was the first stamp that had his picture on it by the United States. And again, the artwork or cachet has him with his stamp collection. So this wasn't light. You know, people today really don't know the extent of it, but it was very, very well known back in the 40s. Franklin Roosevelt and stamps went together. Now this might be hard for you to understand. It's not so hard for me to understand because I have two children who are 27 and 32 and I have thousands of autographed first day covers and they don't want a single one. Well, when Franklin Roosevelt passed away, not one member of his family wanted any part of his stamp collection. Now his son James was the executor of the will. And he thought and thought about it and he said, I think what my father would want is for other collections to have parts of his collection. And so he hired H.R. Harmer Incorporated to uh, handle the auction. He got an expert, George Sloan, to come in, to come to Springwood and appraise the collection. And to tell you how little the family knew about FDR's stamp collection, he told George Sloan, you're probably going to have about 20 albums and maybe uh, three or four uh, cartons that they brought up from Warm Springs in the White House. Well, when George Sloan arrived, he found over 150 albums and about 50 to 60 army containers full of stamps like the ones that I have in mind that I bought to illustrate that he never got to yet. He was just working his way through it. Um, he appraised the entire collection at $85,000, which a lot of people are very surprised that it's that, you know, that was a lot of money, and, but they figured Roosevelt, man of means, he would have had. But you have to understand that Roosevelt never really looked at it for the money. He didn't care if the stamps had a bent corner. In fact, he was criticized in a stamp uh, magazine for handling the stamps with his hands rather than tongues. And I thought it was amusing that the man that made stamp collecting what it is was being criticized. And he would tell them, I don't care if I get my oil of my fingers on the stamps, they're my stamps. And so he appraised it at 85,000. There was so much in the collection that it took Harmer four part sale over seven days. And when the final gavel fell, they had raised $225,000. Everyone wanted a piece of Roosevelt's collection. I just want to conclude, before, and I'll take some questions, FDR, despite his considerable wealth, never viewed or assessed his stamp collection for its monetary value, but always for the education that you can get if you studied a person, place, or event on a stamp, and that was his total focus throughout his lifetime. And uh, he did so much for this hobby, and he learned so much in his own words from it. And uh, I'd be happy to take some questions now if you have any. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the uh, second floor of the post office. I have been Yeah. So, for your comment, it helps the public. Yes, it is. Occasionally, uh, late at night, I'll ride by to get to the post office and I'll see lights on upstairs. Sure. And I'll figure it out from on accidentally. But what's up there? Um, now.
satellite office up there, but I can assure you I shut my light out. <laughs> I've been gone since 2008. Um, there used to be a congressman's office. They moved out. Uh, as far as I know right now, the credit union uh, for the postal workers is up there. Uh, the postal inspectors is up there. If you're going there at night, likely that's the postal inspectors are up there because they work 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, they're overseeing a lot of different things. So any lights on the second floor would be the postal inspectors. But uh, a lot of the offices up there now are vacant and used for training. They're, they're like conference rooms. They have meetings up there now. Uh, a lot of the tenants moved out that we had, like the, the con we had. I'm doing it again. The congressmen and people, they, they moved out. You know, they got a different quarters. Yes? to talk about the secret tunnel um, they built a tunnel and there were a lot of theories to that tunnel if you go in in fact I was just in that tunnel six months ago being filmed for a documentary on structures in Poughkeepsie and they called me up and I went down there and, and crawled through the tunnel and they filmed me in there um, that tunnel goes from the basement of the Poughkeepsie post office all the way to the armory there was once a shoot off that went to the Dutchess County Courthouse. Now that has all been bricked up, as has the entrance at the armory for security reasons. Otherwise, someone could just walk into the post office from the armory. So that's all been blocked up very much. I mean, very thick, uh, you know, walls and everything they put in there. Uh, there was a theory that if Roosevelt was up in Hyde Park, visiting Hyde Park, and something broke out, a war broke out or something, they would get him there and no one would know where he was because he had access to this underground tunnel. In more recent years, from the research I did, because curiosity and me get along very well, and I dug into it, that was more of a um, civil defense uh, type of deal where they kept provisions down there and, you know, and that would have made more sense because it was connected to the armory. You know, the original stories were very interesting how they were, I, I could only picture them wheeling Roosevelt in his, in his wheelchair through the thing. It was very rough ground and, and that's what triggered off a lot of them because I had trouble walking through there and I said there's no way they can get a wheelchair in because I walked pretty far in. Uh, and, and then I turned around and came back, but it, it's very uneven ground and up and down. It's just a very, you know, rough tunnel. So I believe they were putting provisions in there. It was like a c civil defense type of deal. Uh, it's, it's rough. It's, I mean, it's there, but it's rough. You know, it's, the flooring is very rough and uneven. The walls are still intact. You know, I didn't go as far down as the armory because I started hearing little critter noises around me. <laughs> And you know, I've been up here for 30 years, but I was born and raised in Brooklyn. That makes me very nervous, critter noises. <laughs> uh, there are lights, yep. There are lights that go the whole length. Which for the filming, the postmaster replaced all the lights, so they obviously worked. I don't know that they worked before that because no one had been down there for years. We, uh, when Kids Expo, when, yeah, when Kids Expo had their first Kids Expo, I helped the postmaster out there and we would take kids on tours of the building and when we got down there, some, some wise guy letter carrier had taken a pair of postal pants and stuffed it with newspapers and had it sticking out of the side and said, this is where we put the uh, people that don't sort the mass mail fast enough. And I heard one little kid say, geez, I don't want to work for the post office. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, no, no. The post office puts out first day covers with no cache. You can buy them on their website, USPS.com, with no cache. There are probably about seven commercial vendors that put the caches on, and they'll sell the envelopes without the stamp, and then the collectors will buy them blank, put the stamp on, and go to the ceremonies. Um, I was actually, uh, toward the end of my career, I was very happy to be the national coordinator for five 
first day ceremonies and that's why I saw a lot of these people showing up with the covers and, and all of that. Uh, uh, the very last one that I was in charge of was the uh, Purple Heart Stamp, which I had at Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, which is where the first Purple Heart was, it was called the Badge of Merit, but was presented. And uh, that was quite an event. We had 1,200 people at that, so I guess we got the media attention, and that was good. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to be here. I'm not running anywhere. So if you have questions or you want to look at the displays or anything, I have the books here for $15 if you're interested in that. But if you're not, please come and look at the artifacts, and I'll be happy to explain anything. And Sue and the committee and, and all of you folks, thank you very much. Oh, okay. I'm here. Okay. I was told not to leave. You bet. I can't believe the enthusiasm. We love the enthusiasm you bring to the <laughs> Fireside Chat series. You've got to come back again next year now. Promise. Pretty good. And uh, I never thought stamps and post offices were so interesting as you made them out to be. <laughs> but uh, see, let me tell you a little tidbit of a history here. There's a lady who came in this evening, and her father-in-law He's sitting, I don't know whether he's sitting on the running board or that board, but he's at that meeting when they were designing the school district. Oh, no there. kidding. Mrs. Horton. Oh, right here. Here she is. Oh, yeah. really? Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. See, there's always things like that happen when I talk in Hyde Park. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Hyde Park. Now, here's a little gift for you. You can use this when you're looking at your stamp collection and stamp books. Oh, okay. Thanks very Thank much. you very much. John, John and uh, Gloria Golden, of course, very friends of mine. And last year they gave me the history of St. James. And, and I told them in another event, I said, you know, I was opening the book and I told you I collect autographs, historical autographs. And Gloria's father, the Reverend Kidd, a picture was in the book and he had autographed it in fountain pen under the book. And you didn't know about that, and I said, do you want me to give it back? I don't know what to do, but it is a treasure in my collection right now, and it's a very interesting history. Thanks for coming. Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, you'll notice in the flyer in your program uh, a little information about our Hyde Park Community Garden, and Deb Belding is here tonight, who is the inspiration for that garden, and I'd like to have her come and t tell you a little bit about it. Who wants spring? <laughs> I definitely want spring. Um, this is the uh, third year of the Hyde Park Community Garden, located on the grounds of St. James Church in the old baseball field, which uh, was on the corner of Vanderbilt, that's along that section, that we took over that, uh, that defunct baseball field, and we made this into this beautiful, vibrant community garden that uh, last year grew thousands of pounds of uh, fresh vegetables that we donated 100% to the Hyde Park Food Pantry and Meals on Wheels in Hyde Park. Thank you. Thanks so much. So now we need a fence because those deer get in the way and uh, with groundhogs, they're very, they, they're happy over there too. And uh, so we are, we're asking the community if they could help us with that, we would very much appreciate it and that's what the flyer is for. So uh, whatever you can give is, is very much appreciated because it's gonna go to our fence. So, so thank you very much and um, so you wanna Say another word and enjoy the refreshments coming up. I just wanted to have you take note of some special thanks for some people that helped make this program possible. Certainly John and Gloria Golden, who started out with me the first year that we did them as part of our bicentennial uh, celebration and have been part of helping them uh, help us put, it, put them on each year. Also, Bill Millard, who's over here uh, in the corner, who is our audio-visual person. Uh, we have wires all over the place. Uh, Herb Sweet, who is in the back, recording the program for cable TV. And Joanne Lown, who is coordinating the reception in the reading room. 
and there are a lot of uh, other volunteers that are working behind the scenes that help make this possible each each month that we do these chats. So a big thank thank you to all those people that are involved in, in making this possible. We thank you all for coming tonight um, to this very informative program. And on the back of your program, uh, you will see the rest of the uh, chats that are scheduled, two additional chats, and we do hope that you'll come uh, to both of them, or if not that, at least one. And now um, Mr. Muso has a wonderful display set up in the reading room uh, that he talked about during his program. So we do hope that you'll uh, stop by and check it out. And he has a copy of his book uh, for sale as well. So um, please go in and um, have some refreshments and take a look at the display. Give us a couple seconds to put the chairs away and then please join us and thank you again for coming. <laughs>